So if you have a Bible today, I want you to open to Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from verse 16 to verse 26. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, and that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evidence, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are of Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I, I want to speak today about not just the subject of the Holy Spirit, which is my favorite subject. People say, why is it your favorite subject? Isn't it Jesus? That's, I, I love Jesus, but Jesus is in, in the heavens. He is at the right hand of God. And he said, it's better that I go away that I send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one we have on earth. He's the member of, uh, of the Trinity of the Godhead who's with us today. And we desperately need to get where God wants to take us. We desperately need to know him and to have a true relationship with Holy Spirit. And um, I, I'm speaking today because I believe God showed me there's a lot of Christians, a lot of believers. And if you are, if you are somebody who's come to the cross and you, you, you know Jesus died on the cross for you and you've humbled yourself and all, you've had to, all you have to do is come and receive what he's done and say, I, I know I'm a sinner and I, I come to receive that forgiveness today. The moment you do that, the moment you do, the moment you come and acknowledge that you need to be forgiven and you come and realize that Jesus shed his blood so that you could be forgiven and reconciled to God, and admitted to heaven. That's, that's all you have to do. The moment you do that and humble yourself, the very day you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So you, you, you have the Holy Spirit right then and there. You should never doubt that. You receive the Holy Spirit as soon as you are become a Christian. Your temple, the Holy Spirit is a person, a spiritual person. He comes to live inside you. And, and a lot of people today, particularly in Pentecostal churches, they know what it is to be filled with the Spirit. But they know, some of us know what it is to receive the baptism of the Spirit, the move in the gifts of the Spirit. But I believe what God is showing me today that, that we, very few people know what it is to walk in the Spirit to the degree how God wants us to walk in the Spirit. God's intention, and He's going to bring us into a place where His people are walking in the Spirit. And that means to walk as the Spirit walks be led by the Spirit. And as we do that, God's people, God will, will, will actually release specific instructions from heaven to you. Not general, but specific instructions. Where to go. Who to marry. Where the trouble is. What to avoid. What's coming up in the future? Because as the Bible says the Holy Spirit will show us the things to come. What is true? What is not true? Who is true? Who is not true? And, and God said to me, he's going to bring the church back to a level that the church existed in in the early days. And uh, the early church was so led and so specifically led by the Holy Spirit. It walked in the Spirit. And I'll show you, if you go to Acts chapter 13 first, this is where God's going to bring the church back to. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manius, who had been brought up 
with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Paul and Silas for the work to which I have called them. And having fasted and prayed, they went away, so being went out, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit. If you go over just a couple of pages to Acts chapter 16, Paul and, and Silas, they go out and they're incredibly fruitful. Even though they have opposition, they plant new churches. Thousands of people are being saved. Demons are being cast out of people. Sick are being healed. God's just using them wonderfully to set captive streets. People's lives are being changed. They're receiving the peace of God and the joy of God. And, and they're going and then... Paul wants to go into Asia because Asia is so dark. And he says, surely we're being told to go into all the world. We have the world. We want to go into Asia because Asia is so dark. And I'm all for missionaries going into all the world because we're being told to go into all the world. But a lot of missionaries return. Do you know that? Because they haven't received specific instructions. A lot, I've met a lot of missionaries who've gone to the mission field and they come back in two or three years five years and they're defeated because they've just gone in human zeal for Jesus but not received specific instructions. But the whole early church was so directed by the Spirit of God. It says when they had gone through Fidget, they want to go to Asia, by, by the way, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to, produ- to preach the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Messia, they came down to Troash, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So they wanted to go in Asia, and they wanted to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit did not permit them. The Spirit forbid them to preach in Asia, And they went down to Troas, and I imagine they said, what do we do now? What do we do now? We've got to check in our spirit. We can't go forward, and we don't know what to do. Probably a little bit confounded. And as they sit, and as they fast, and they prayed, God revealed his, his, his will to them. A vision of a man came to them from Macedonia, and he said, come. This is a new assignment for you. And God wants to lead you just as specifically as he led them. God wants to speak to you in dreams and visions. God wants to direct your life. God wants to show you clearly where danger is and where where blessing is. God wants to direct you specifically through the power of the Holy Spirit. Specifically. It's what God is saying to me. He wants us to have a, a close walk. And so Paul, I love this, he goes over to Macedonia. God's ways are not our ways. He must have been a little bit confounded at the first because when he got there, there wasn't a man. There was a woman called Lydia and he went to her house and he ministered and a few got saved. And then a demon girl followed her, had a spirit of divination. She was a fortune teller and her owners used to make money out of this little girl. She was a young woman who could tell, the, tell people's future by the power of a devil. And she was going along saying, that Paul, he's a servant of the Most High God, and he's the one who will bring you true salvation. He's the one that preaches Jesus. And she kept saying this and kept following. And in the end, Paul, because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, just used the authority he has. He was being demonically harassed, and he said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And then the devil came out of her, and she was no good anymore. They couldn't make any money because she couldn't fortune tell. So Paul was then put into jail, and he was beaten, and he was whipped. And then he met the man from Macedonia. It was the jailer. But they were directed clearly by the Holy Spirit. And it's not just in the New Testament. If you go to the Old Testament, uh, we had a wonderful meeting on Friday night if you were here. It was a wonderful meeting. We had a meeting on um, abiding and I spoke about the cloud. In the Old Testament, the cloud was the presence of God. It's the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. And you can see just how clearly God led his people in the Old Testament. In Numbers 9, 16, it says, God led them by cloud in the day and fire by night. The cloud protected them because the sun would have killed them. That's what the presence of God does in your life. And the fire warmed them because they would have died in the desert. 
and the presence of God leads you and keeps you. It says, so it was always the cloud covered it by day. That's, that's the camp. And the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children would journey. And the place where the cloud settled, there the children would pitch their tent. And it goes on and on and on in these verses saying, even when the cloud continued long, many days, the children kept the charge of the Lord and did not journey. And, and then it goes to say, whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. As the command of the Lord, they remained encamped. And at the command of the Lord, they journey. They kept the command of the Lord. So they were completely and utterly led by the cloud, which is the Holy Spirit. Completely led by the cloud. And the early church was completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit to lead them in all their missions, in all their works, in all their activities, in everything they did, they, need, they, need, they knew they needed the manifest, real, physical presence, voice of the Holy Spirit, directing them, speaking to them, and leading them. And there's only one time, really, in the Old Testament where I, 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 I remember, there may be others, but I just couldn't remember in preparation, where they, they, they didn't follow the cloud. They, they, they were told as they go in the promised land, that God was going to lead them in and the presence of God was going to go with them. But when they got there, they moved in unbelief and they pulled back. And then when they realized their, their mistake, they decided to go up and attack this enemy, not being led by the cloud, but just through a good human decision. Now, now listen, you're either led by human decisions or you're led by the cloud. There's only two options. And I, I, the passage I read was about the flesh and the spirit. There's only two options. We either lead our lives through making just human decisions, which we call, someone calls wisdom, or we are led by the spirit of God. And in this time, instead of being led by the cloud, being prompted by the Holy Spirit, waiting for the Spirit of God and moving with the Spirit of God, they missed it and they came back and they said, having missed it, the cloud's not moving now, but we're going to make a good human decision and we're just going to go up against the enemy in our own flesh, in our own power. And Moses looked at him and said, it's not a good idea. You're going to take a terrible beating. And, and when they went up, the enemy defeated them so bad, it actually says that they were chased by bees. That, that they, 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 they were defeated by the army and they were actually chased by bees. Because they acted without the Holy Spirit. I got some testimonies. There's times in my ministry where I've acted without the Holy Spirit and I've been chased by bees and I don't recommend it. I remember years ago, I had a, a guy come to me and he said, um, we're going to use you. We, we, we want, we want, I was frustrated because the church was small and I knew God was calling me bigger. He said, we want to use you in this national campaign. It's called Power to Change. We're going to go into every city and we're going to have these big meetings and, and, and thousands are going to come and get saved. They're going to hear the gospel and you're going to preach and, and we're going to do this. And the first one's going to be up in Rudy Hill. We've hired the whole civic center and it holds a thousand people. And we're going to do this. And this, this, these two guys were leading it. And, and every time I went up to meet with them to plan the meetings, I would get to the end of Gosford and the Holy Spirit would say, don't. But you know, you can push through. You can just be led by your decisions, by zeal, by thinking, this is, I'm just going to push through. And to cut a long story short, I took some people up to the first meeting and I said, it's going to be fantastic. I took about 30 people from the church. I church I had about 40, but I took most of the church with me. I said, it's going to be fantastic. There's going to be a thousand people there tonight and everyone's going to get saved. We're going to hear the gospel. And we went to this prayer meeting beforehand and we prayed and we prayed and heaven came down. The anointing was there. Heaven came down. And I said, okay, let's go. We're going to go and have the meeting. They're all ready now. And the people came and they said, okay, pastor, we're ready for you to preach. And they came out. And there's about 16 people there. God was in none of it. He was in none of it. 
It was a good idea, but it wasn't a God idea. On the contrary, the Holy Spirit told me to put up the tent at Easter. And some people said, what do you want to do that for, Pastor? We can just have the meetings in the church. But everybody saw how fruitful those meetings were. But we, we, we need to be led by the Spirit of God. And we need to understand God doesn't want us to live as good as just the human mind. He doesn't want to live just making what you think wise decisions. He wants to take you to a level above that. He wants to take you to a new dimension where that you don't have just a good mind and making sound decisions, but you actually have the mind of Christ. And the only way you can have the mind of Christ is through the Holy Spirit. But he wants to give you his mind. He wants to give you wisdom that's not of this world and direction that's out of this world and to be able to, to be directed and led in ways that are just too wonderful. That's what God wants to do through the person of the Holy Spirit and, and, and bringing you into a place where you actually walk in and with the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, see, some of us are frustrated. We're in this cycle. And, and we're wondering why, I call it, I call it the, the, uh, the sin, repentance, and confession cycle. Some of us wonder why we, we, we actually were always angry, we're always frustrated, we're always, uh, uh, or maybe you're looking at things you shouldn't look at, you're lustful, uh, you're gossipy, and you know, you know you're not changing. And you know you're not, and you're frustrated. And let me tell you, th- 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 this passage that I read out says, the fruit of the flesh, the works of the flesh are evident. Fornication, adultery, lewdness, murderers, heresies, drunkenness, outbusts, rush, jealousies. And the reason we're not growing and making progress is because flesh cannot restrain flesh. And we can tell if we're actually walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. If we are having these issues in an ongoing way and we're not changing, it's because our flesh is leading our life. It's your, all, just, all your senses, just being led by your human senses and not the person of the Holy Spirit. And we can't mature. Our character can't change and develop into what the Bible has, has promised. He's promised us Christ-likeness. He's promised us gentleness. He's promised us love. He's promised us true peace. He's promised us true joy, true faithfulness, long-suffering. There's a fruit of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is leading you and you're yielded to Him and you're actually dependent upon Him. He starts to infuse your life and to produce a changed character. But it's not my, but of might, not by power, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is only the Holy Spirit that's going to change you. And so many Christians are trying to change themselves and they're frustrated. They're frustrated. But God wants to lead you. He wants to change you. And when you are, allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in your life. This is what it says. There's no, in Romans 8, it says, there's no condemnation for those who walk in the Spirit. It speaks about the Holy Spirit gives you the spirit of sonship. You don't feel like an orphan anymore. When the Holy Spirit starts to deal with you and meet with you and talk to you, you'll have the character of Christ. I'll tell you another thing about what happens when the Holy Spirit starts to lead you. You'll never, ever, ever be permanently defeated. Now, when I say that, you may get attacked. However, you will be demonically harassed. You will be demonically harassed. I read out the passage about Paul in Acts chapter 16. You can read it when you go home. He's, he's ministering and he's being fruitful and, and the devil sends this girl against him with a spirit of divination and he ends up in jail. But then, a real servant of God when he's put in the jail, it's just a big, bigger reason to praise God. He starts praising God and then the whole jail gets saved. So although you can have setbacks, if you work on the Holy Spirit, you'll never be defeated because he is the one who's more than a conqueror when you walk in him. You know that passage that says, more than a, we are more than a conqueror in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. People don't understand. That whole passage is about the Holy Spirit. It's Romans chapter 8. It's all to do with the Holy Spirit. And those things only become manifest and real when you walk in the Spirit. You're only more than a conqueror when the Holy Spirit's got a hold of your life. You only can do all things through Christ when you're led by the Spirit. 
But Paul was down, but he was never out. He was harassed. I like when he, he, he ministered to this guy called uh, something Sergius. And he's preaching and he's winning this guy. And then all of a sudden, right next to him, this guy called Bar Jesus rises up, who's got a demon and starts preaching against him. So Paul goes, in the power of Jesus, I'm going to could that demon be blind. And he's blinded immediately. And the guy gets saved. So although he was harassed, when he was walking in the Spirit, he was always, always successful, always victorious, and he could not be stopped. He could never, ever, ever be defeated. That's what God wants for your life. He wants you to know, not that you're going to have a trouble-free life, but every trouble is temporary. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but out of them all, God will deliver you. That's his promise. You say, I, I want to be really practical here. I want to be really practical here today. How do you walk in the Holy Spirit? I want to say the first thing. If I've ever done this in this church, I ask you forgiveness, but I don't mean to. If I've ever, if I've ever given the impression that, that some things are for super saints or you've got to be a pastor for certain levels, it's all for us. There's 120 people in the, in the upper room. When the fire of God, the Holy Spirit came, they all received. It, it's for everybody. There's no levels. There's no super saints. There's no special people in the kingdom of God. If you believe in Jesus, it's all for you. His whole book is for you. So be encouraged. You don't have to be some spiritual giant. It's not just for some. Okay, just be practical. You need to surrender your life fully. You need to surrender your life. You need to actually say, this is really, I'm being practical here. I actually, I don't want to preach theology. I, I, I read this book a little while ago on the Holy Spirit and I read it. And I thought, I couldn't even, I've, I've, I've been to Bible college. <laughs> I've been a pastor 20 years. I couldn't understand it. And I thought, it's just, it's so complicated, all the things you had to do. And I know I walk in the Spirit, and I thought, it's just not that hard. This is the genesis of this message, because I read it, and I thought, I don't want to do that in my church. I want to give people practical, real, helpful, God-given, Holy Spirit-inspired help that gets you to where God wants you to get to. But you do have to surrender your life. You actually have to, you actually have to humbly surrender your life and actually acknowledge. You know, the flesh can do nothing. There's a humility in that. You know, when I just make a decision without the Holy Spirit, my very, very best day, it can accomplish nothing. Nothing eternal, nothing beneficial, nothing that God considers good. It, it, it accomplished that. So you've got to surrender your will, your will to, the, to God and say, I want your will. I want you to lead me. And secondly, here it says, it just, I want you to say, notice this passage that I read at the start. The flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary to one another. And then it speaks about in, in 1 Peter that the flesh wars against the spirit. It wars against the spirit. So I don't perfectly walk in the spirit. I have better days than other days. I'm getting better and better all the time. But until you die, there's going to be a battle within. There's a war within you. Your flesh is still living. But you have the Spirit of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead has come to abide in you. And, and what that says here, you've got to realize the danger of the flesh and the problem of the flesh. If you think that your human decisions are good and they're, you, you're just able to get through your life just living in the flesh and get some... I sh I, I sh You've got to see what God thinks of the flesh. If you want to think what God thinks of the flesh, look at the cross. God crucified it. And this is what the Bible says. In verse 24 of the passage I read, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. If those that are in Christ have crucified the flesh. So there has to be in something in you that says... Just my carnal thinking, my, 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 my human appetites, 
my human appetites, which I know are not godly. Maybe it's to drink or to look at wrong stuff or, or to gossip or, or to, uh, to hold on. Whatever it is, that, that the flesh, you actually have to, have to deliberately be at war against this. And it says those that are in the Spirit have crucified the flesh. There has to be an understanding that my, there's no good thing in my flesh and today it's going to die, I die daily. I crucify it and I continue to crucify it. I continue to crucify it. It's dead until you walk by faith knowing that your flesh is dead. I still try to rise up again no matter how spiritual you are. You've got to continue to war against the flesh and as you do that, the Holy Spirit, I call it the divine takeover. He starts to take over. And it's like you, have, you, have, you hear a voice, you've got a human voice, you know your own voice. There's the devil voice, there's the world's voice. You know how to, your heart starts to hear the ho- voice of the Holy Spirit? It's like when you first hear your wife's voice. You, maybe you don't recognize it the first time, but then second time you do. And then th- th- you become more and more familiar. That's how it is walking with God. I said it's walking with the Spirit. You become more familiar the more you do, the more you walk with Him. So you've got to crucify the flesh. And you've got to actually believe. Just go to uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 9. I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened. No, there's no ifs, ifs there. For everyone who asks will receive. If a son asks for bread, who will give him a stone? Or if he seeks for a fish, who will give him a serpent instead of a fish? Verse 13, if you then being evil know the good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So when you ask God to lead me by the Holy Spirit, He's not going to give you, He's not going to deceive you, He's not going to let the devil speak to you and double guess you and and hear all these other voices. He will will give you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit always honors faith. Never doubt. Never doubt. So you've asked for Him. He will give you the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the... if we want to walk in the Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is, Jesus says, come to me and living waters will flow from you. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can be in you as a river or a pond. And that's why we're told to stir up the gift. If we want to have a Holy Spirit, you've got to stir up the gift. That's what we have in this church, lots of prayer meetings, lots of praise meetings, what's going to have tonight. The more prayer and praise you have, the more of the Holy Spirit you're going to have. The more prayer and praise you have in your, in your lounge room, in your home, in your church, the more you're going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to be directed by the voice of the Holy Spirit. But you've got to stir yourself, and you've got to stir yourself to seek God. Nothing's just easy. Nothing's just going to happen unless you seek the face of God, unless you pray, unless you push into His Word. And it's not like a, the, we live in this microwave fire five-minute society. It's going to take time. You've got to actually seek God's face and seek to be in His presence. I'll tell you how that looks. If you go to uh, 1 Samuel, this is not original, but this is what I believe. God reminded me of again. I've, I've, I've preached this before, but this is, this is a part of, this is what happens when you actually put yourself aside. Just put time aside. And you can watch your TV, you can watch your sport, you can, and you say, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to go and seek God. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to go and have a meeting in the secret place with my father. I'm going to actually have, spend some quality time, quality time with my God. And this, is a, this, is, this passage I want us to read today is, is I believe it's a, the, the Old Testament is called Types and Shadows. And I believe there's a, there's a, there's a type, there's a shadow here of how the Holy Spirit works in the believer's life. And I think it's in this passage here. And it's, it's not original. I've, I got this somewhere else. I can't remember where I got it. But this, this is a time where Saul's father called Kish had donkeys. A man called Saul. He had a father called Kish. And, he had, and they lost these donkeys. And the donkeys were very, very valuable. And they couldn't find them. So Kish sends his son out, Saul, and says, you've got to go and find the donkeys. So they go and find the donkeys, and they look everywhere, but they cannot find them. 
And, and I look here and I look there. I spend days looking for these donkeys. I can't find these donkeys. And so he's stressed and he needs direction. He needs direction to know where the donkeys are and he's asking for direction. And finally, his servant who he took with him says, like, there's actually the prophet who actually hears from God. Name Samuel, why don't we go and see him? So they go up and see Samuel, and Samuel's a prophet. And they come, and uh, in, in verse 15, God has been speaking to Samuel already about Saul. He didn't know, but Saul was going to be the leader of God's people. And, uh, and verse 17 says, When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, and said, This is the man of whom I spoke, shall reign over my people. Saul came to Samuel and said, Please tell me, uh, so, so, oh, sorry, Saul asked Samuel, where's the, so, so, the seer's house? Saul answered him and said, I am the seer. Go up before me in the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I'll let you go, and I'll tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys, they were lost three days ago. Do not be anxious about them, for they have been found and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on your father's house? And Saul answered him and said, oh, I'm only a Benjamite. Verse 22, now Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and had them sit at the place of honor uh, and invited them basically to a meal. Samuel said to the cook, bring the petition, the portion which I've set aside. So they cooked food for him. Goes on. Uh, here it is, the bit that was kept back in verse 24. It was set apart for you. Eat, for until this time it has been kept for you. Since I said I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. When they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. They arose early and it was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the top of the house saying, Get up that I may send you on your way. And Saul arose and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. And they were going down to the outskirts of the city. Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And he went on. But you stand here while you, I may announce to you the word of God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on the head and kissed him and said, it is not because the Lord has anointed you, commander over his people. When are you have departed from that today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin and they will say to you the donkeys which you went to look for have been found and know that your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and worry about you that's a beautiful passage and I believe as I said earlier it's a passage I think that represents how the Holy Spirit Saul is like a he's uh, like one of us Saul is like someone who's troubled and we often have things in our mind and we're worried. He can't find his donkeys and he's stressed and he needs direction and he's got these concerns, he's got his problems, he's got his anxiety and he's looking for direction. And sometimes we just want to go to God and say, I just, I just want direction. Just help me, just help solve my problems. But this is how the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't work like it. He's not just an ADM machine and a problem solver. You know what Saul says? Saul represents, oh sorry, Samuel represents the Holy Spirit. And what he says, he says to, 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 to Saul, first of all, he says, do not be anxious about the donkeys. In other words, stop thinking about your problems. Stop thinking about your issues. Stop worrying about what, what, what your answers you need. But he said, first, I want you to come to the table. Come to the table and eat. And that's what God does when we go into the secret place and meet in his presence. We actually says, come to the table. I'll set a table for you in the presence of my enemies. And at the table of just fellowshipping in his presence in the Holy Spirit, he pours out all his goodness and he makes the enemy watch. And so Saul brings Samuel to the table. And he says, stop thinking about your problems. Let it be settled. Let your heart be settled. Just trust Trust and come to the table seeking to know what God's heart is. What God's heart for you is. He says, I'll let you go and I'll tell you all that is in your heart. That's what you want to do when you go in the presence of God. You meet with the Holy Spirit. You actually want to know. You don't want your, you don't want your problems solved. You actually want to know God's heart and what is your eternal purpose. God, just show me your heart today. Show me your heart and your eternal purpose for my life. Just 
and, and, and sitting at the table, it's just it's time of fellowship with God. And I start every day with at least an hour, sometimes two, three hours, just sitting in the presence of God. And I don't know how to do it any other way. But to be led by the Holy Spirit, there is no other way than to constantly come to the table. Come to the table. Give God a good amount of time. And this is what happens when you come to the table. You put your anxiety away. You just want to know God's heart and his purposes for your life. I just love this. You know what Saul did? First of all, he kissed. Samuel kissed Saul. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit will shed abroad in your heart the love of God. He sheds the, he kisses you. He lets you know by experience at the table, you're loved. You're precious to me. You serve me. I, have none, I don't have many like you. You're valuable. You've got to know your love of God. You've got to know God's love for you personally because perfect, that perfect love casts out fear. So when you come into the presence, the Holy Spirit sheds his love abroad in your heart. And then I love this. He says, and I'll announce to you the word of God. That's revelation. The Holy Spirit lifts the word of God, lifts all the mysteries off the lid of the word of God. He reveals what the word of God really means to you. So he comes, he reminds you how loved Nothing's going to touch you. He gives you revelation. And then verse 10, chapter, chapter 10, verse 1. Samuel kissed him. Is this not because the Lord has anointed you? And he put oil on his head and anointed him. And he said, I anointed you. Commander over the inheritance. Now, Saul didn't know that was his destiny. Saul didn't know that was his purpose in God. Saul didn't know that what he, was, what, what he was going to be in God. He just simply came to the table and Samuel revealed it to him. It's like the Holy Spirit comes and reveals the things we're called to do, the things that God wants to do, the great things God's designed for your future, who God has made you to be. God, uh, Samuel said, you are just not Saul. You are commander of the people. And the Holy Spirit reminds you, you are more than a conqueror and, th and that in Christ you can do all things and that Christ will strengthen you in your weakness, that he reminds you who you really are in Christ and what you're capable of and where God's going to lead you. So he comes. The Holy Spirit reveals how much we're loved. He gives us revelation of the word. He gives us a fresh anointing. He reveals our destiny of who we are in the Holy Spirit. And then at the end, I just love this. It's almost like an aside in chapter 2, in verse 2. Then the problem, you know, he came into that place. He came in that time of meeting. He came to the table with, with, with Samuel, seeking direction. And at the end, uh, verse 2, just as he's going to go, he says, oh, oh, by the way, when you've departed... You're going to go, you're going to see two men by Rachel's house. The bed, your donkey's going to be, they're very, very specific instructions. They're very, very specific directions on where to go to find the donkey. So it's almost like you're going to get the specific direction. You're going to get the direction you need, but it's almost like an aside. That's, that's not what you need. You actually need every day to know how deeply you're loved by God. You need fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit today. You need to be reminded who you are in Christ and then the directions that you seek will come. The directions that you seek will come. The problem that you need solved. God will just release it to you. Holy Spirit will release it to you. 